Our final speaker today is Dr. Anne Hogden. Her research focuses on patient-centred care, patient decision-making and multidisciplinary team processes. Much of her work has been set within the, dy the dynamic context of degenerative conditions such as MND and includes developing a model of patient-centred decision-making in, in the MND multidisciplinary care. This model highlighted the importance of patient engagement and carer participation in decision-making with MND health professionals. As outlined in the 25 report, Anne is developing a web-based decision support tool for MND patients, carers, health professionals to use in clinical care. Please welcome Dr. Anne Hogden speaking on translating research into practice. How do we make research useful for people living with MND? Thanks, everyone. Three very, very difficult acts to follow. However, I'll do my best and get us in on time for lunch. So basically, um, I'm going to lift our focus a bit and broaden it. What I'm going to be talking about is translation. And as we know, translation means many different things to, to many different people, depending on the type of science area that you're working in or your research field. And with the question, how do we make research useful to people living with MND. In my mind, only people living with MND can actually fully answer that question. But I'm going to have a crack at it. From what I know from what people with MND have told me, what I know from translation science, and what I know from co-design and patient-centred care principles. So I was asked to sort of discuss what might, you know, as part of this session, what's a roadmap for our future? Now, this is a, a road that we're all travelling together, so essentially my, my talk is kind of like we are a snapshot of MND and the MND community. So what we want to look at is how do we look at our research processes? And we've talked about bench-to-bed side, we've talked about models that go from animal to human. I want to broaden that to looking at concept of our research, developing our concepts, and getting that all the way through to practice and policy. So it's a very wide focus, if you like. So traditionally, our models look, you know, we have our concept, we think about it, we think, where can we get money? We apply for our ethics, we get our funding, we implement our research project. If, if we're on a roll, we evaluate it. And then maybe if we're really, really lucky, we know some way to get it into clinical practice and then into policy, ideally. However, there are some well-known barriers to translating research, and I've just sort of highlighted two here. One of them is the lack of a common language. And uh, I won't say too much about that, just that if you know, we look at the research that we're all doing in hugely diverse areas, and you look through the, the program that we have today in the abstracts, many, many different languages used to express what we're working on in MND research. And I know that I can look at many of the abstracts and even many of the titles, and I'm a little bit lost. I don't really understand what that is. So what we're talking about here is people talking to people. It's not just bench talk going to bedside, but it's really people connecting with other people within the MND community. The other area that we'll touch on is the lack of shared agenda and research purpose. And this is what translates research across the continuum, having a shared purpose and having a shared agenda. So we're looking for our common goals. Essentially, who is travelling on this road with us to either cure, to find a very effective treatment that knocks MND out of the ballpark, or to improve the quality of life of people living with MND in the meantime? So basically, I think we're a snapshot of the MND community, as I said. So we have people living with MND, we have family members, we have people who just touch on MND by participating in fundraising activities such as the Walk to Defeat MND. And generally, we have the public, the great broader public, where we're constantly trying to get their attention to say, this is MND, this is what it does to people, this is why we need your support and your funding to get rid of this disease. We then have our health professionals, and then the MND associations and support groups, patient support groups more broadly, community organisations and fundraising bodies who are working to support the research that we do and support people living with MND. And then we have us as researchers 
and then we have people who work in government and work in, as policy makers. Now, it's very easy to slot yourself into one of those categories, but if you think a little bit deeper, you'll find that you've probably worked in at least two or three, if not four or five of these categories across the board. We've all been involved in fundraising activities at some point. A lot of us have worked as health professionals, either concurrently with their research work or, or as a follow-on, like myself. Um, with, uh, as researchers and MND association workers, we've all had time to comment on things like policy, such as the NDIS, that's been a big one um, recently that's taken a lot of attention up from health professionals, from the MND association workers, from researchers, and also with, for people with MND as well. So it's a very interconnected road that we travel on, if you like. It's quite complicated, but you know, we, we sort of lap over on each other and ourselves to do the work that we do. OK, so going back a bit, sorry, I should just go back to that. So the MND community, I'm going to label these everybody basically as stakeholders, because that's kind of an, an easy way to lump everybody together to talk about this. But um, these are the stakeholders in MND research, if you like. So why do we engage with stakeholders in our research? It's very easy for us to sit down and think about a project and then to put it together, apply for funding, get funding, carry out the project and evaluate it on our own or in a lab group or in a team. But why do we need to take that a little bit wider? And basically, it is to identify both the problems and solutions with patients to improve the quality of our care. And what I'm arguing is, that patients, people living with MND, need to be involved way back at the concept stage of our projects, not just as on the, on the uh, translation when we're trying to get it into clinical practice or we're trying to get it out into the broader community. So why engage? Well, there's many, many reasons to do this, because we work in partnership to enhance quality of research, because we have then collaborative decision-making projects that we've developed together. And we talk about our research, combined research priorities. It's not just the priorities of the researchers or the priorities of the patients or the priorities of the people funding it. If we're sitting down and talking together, we've got collaborative approaches that may hopefully overlap. As we often find, the priorities of researchers may be very, very different to the priorities of health professionals and very different, again, to the priorities of patients and caregivers and family members. Um, so, and this creates a very strong opportunity to, for us to co-design research that is meaningful for people living with MND. Um, basically, the sticks in this are the, the, the funding bodies. Um, it's often a requirement of larger funding bodies that you, what they call consumer engagement or having a consumer involved on your committee so that you, you're represented or they see you as representing the views of people living with MND. It's not always easy to have someone living with MND who's able to participate in your uh, research project, in your research group, but wonderful if you can, if you can achieve that. Uh, it's now a requirement of health service accreditation, so anybody who's worked in an acute care hospital setting will now know that you are accredited on a four-year cycle to demonstrate how you partner with consumers in your healthcare service delivery, how involved consumers are all the way through your healthcare services. Most people find that's a difficult, difficult thing to demonstrate and it's a bit of a burden, but it's, to my mind, incredibly important. And then also human eth uh, research Ethics committees also require that you have some sort of consumer representation so that, that people with MND on whom you are conducting your research or with whom you are conducting your research have a say in what you are doing and how you do it. So getting down to the nitty gritty of this, I'm only really going to skate over the top of this because it, it's... Um, it's very, very local information. We, I can be happy to talk to people about the, how you go about this in detail over, over lunch. But basically, when we're looking at, at stakeholder engagement, we really need to know who are our stakeholders. None of us work in isolation. We may work in a team or a lab or a group or an institute. Um, but we are connected somewhere with a clinic. We are connected somewhere with researchers who do different types of research to, to we, what we do. And we are also connected to MND associations, even through funding or through local MND groups. We're all represented out there. None of us work in the boondocks. We're all essentially, I mean, pretty much we've got 
almost, we've got all the states, I don't think the territories are represented here today, but we've got researchers from numerous institutes, from numerous metropolitan areas, which are where all our clinics lie and where all our um, MND association groups are represented as well. So if we look at the people that we can connect in with, we then have to think about well, who's missing from that? Who would we want to engage with our research to make sure that it's, it's able to be translated into the bigger picture further down the track? And what are our points of interconnection? So who do we talk to? Who do we tell about our research? Who knows what we're doing? Who's interested in what we're doing and who wants to come and talk to us and give us their thoughts on what we're doing? When, I mean, when you're looking at, at, at something that you're doing in a lab, you're not really asking someone, a family member of someone living with MND, you know, how, how should I poke this zebra fish? It's more about, this is what I'm doing, this is what the meaning is long term, this is where it's going to kick in and be, uh, be helpful to people living with MND and families. I want to know what you think of it and how we conduct our research and what you want to know about our progress and how we communicate all those things with you. So again, involving people with MND from the point of conception, where you're having those discussions about those projects that you want to do. And again, as with everything, there's a model for this. This is a model of consumer engagement. And it just, it, the numbers basically list at what, how much involvement consumers have with projects. And when we're talking about um, concept development and carrying that through, we're sort of sitting around about the level three of the engagement process. Okay, so the next bit I'd like to talk about is the challenges or the potholes in the road exactly. They're not things that stop our research, but they're things that slow it down. And as we all know, from working in the field of MND, time is absolutely precious, and we can't you know, afford to be too delayed with things. And if we do, we have to find ways to work around it. So I'll just tell you a little, bit about, a little bit about my own project, which is the Decision Support Tools project. So MND Victoria Research Grant funded, with seed funding for 12 months in 2015. And so from that point onwards, this project's been going and still going. And we've, we've just last night reached a little milestone in the project, which I'm very excited to tell you about. So the concept was actually developed through research findings where I did speak to patients and carers, but not particularly about this project. So if I had my time again, I'd probably have mentioned this project when I was talking to them to see, just to get a little bit more opinion from them on what they thought of it. I mean, I think developing decision tools is a great idea, but do they think that's a great idea? Do they perceive a need for it? What's their understanding of decision tools? All very, you know, it's been done in other fields, but not, not specifically in MND before. So what we did was we had our idea to develop tools. We then decided we were going to do it through very, very extensive um, stakeholder engagement. So on my field, of, a group of stakeholders who formed my expert panel, we have people living with MND, we have carers, we have um, health professionals, we have um, researchers, so clinical researchers and lab researchers and researchers in decision tool development. And there's one field I'm missing. Anyway, um, policy, sorry. Um, and, oh yeah, and, and um, human factors research, sorry. So then with that, we've gone local, we've gone national, we've gone international. So the project work that I've been doing initially linked in with a team developing decision tools in Germany. They've since kind of faded away a bit and that priority's dropped off their radar at this point in time. But we've since picked up uh, a research group in, in the UK who are currently trying to develop the same thing in parallel with us. So what I had to do is end up broadening my stakeholder group to then in include the people in the UK and in include more people in the clinics here to get voices and opinions on, on how these tools are being developed. So my plan initially was to develop a draft decision tool in 12 months, very, very optimistic, very, very naive. Um, and we'll talk about the potholes in a minute, but basically where we've gotten to now is uh, two years down the track. I do have a draft, I do have two websites developed and they're going to be launched in the very, very near future. So we'll talk about that in a second. So this is um, basically what we did was to set up the websites for our decision tools. I commissioned an illustrator, so this is one of his illustrations I just wanted to show you. That's uh, I'm very, very pleased with his work and he sort of captured what it looks like. You know, if you're considering gastro... This is, sorry, this is the tool for uh, making a decision to have or not have gastrostomy and so this is the, um, the peg, basically. And this is the, uh, one of the illustrations that's gone, that's gone with that. 
Okay, so the potholes in my project essentially were getting health service ethics. Now, depending on your perspective, this is a very challenging thing or this is a very, very good thing. As a researcher, traditionally, we had our research idea, we got it approved by an ethics committee, we trotted off into the hospital, we collected our data, we took it away, wrote some papers and got some glory out of it. Doesn't work like that anymore. These days, if you want to conduct research inside a, uh, a healthcare institution, essentially they want ownership of the data, fair enough, because we're working with their health professionals, we're working with their patients, they need some kind of ownership over that. So the process for getting ethical clearance within their institution is now very, very time consuming, it, it keeps changing at government level and at local level, but once you've got it, you're there and you're enmeshed and short of being embedded within a, a hospital or a health service, um, you then, you then have everybody on board. So that's, in the long run, it's a good thing and very, very good for the health services to be producing their own research and data. Um, so once ethics kind of delayed on my 12-month timeline, that, that took about six months, I then had time for recruitment. And that took a lot longer than I anticipated as well. So um, I just had to find different ways of recruiting. I couldn't get... Uh, people living with MND in the, the situation where I first uh, thought that I was going to recruit from, so I then had to think, okay, how else do I do this? I ended up going to the Motor Neurone Disease State Associations and asking them, can I recruit patients through you, which was a whole different process again, but um, much, much more friendly, I think. It, it, was, it was terrific and people volunteered and put up their hand. So that was one way, anyway. Um, then the other thing that, that occurred, because my 12-month project is now essentially blown out into two years and beyond, the people living with MND who were part of my expert panel could not continue um, their, their participation for various reasons. And so it, it's then become a, a process of recruiting more people with living MND. You haven't actually been there from the beginning, but they're willing to come on board later in the piece. So that, that's all good. So the potholes aren't as deep as they, as they look. They just, they're just a bit distracting. So the smoothers, I couldn't think of a better word, you know, it's a wheelbarrow up the guy, asphalt, pothole, it doesn't quite work for me, but anyway. Having a wonderful supportive stakeholder group who are very keen to hear the progress and keep in touch with updates and are then very happy to offer advice from their own perspectives. Um, the t my time and availability and their time and availability. I mean, I've been able to continue this project unfunded for, um, for the last year or two years onwards, yeah. Um, and so I've been very lucky that my institute has supported me to do this because they're very keen to, to get an outcome from it. Um, for me, persistence and patience, um, it's something I have in spades, so I just keep plugging away, plugging away, plugging away and, and seeing where we get. Um, good communication, I'm able to communicate very, very regularly with my, um, with my stakeholder group and other research groups that are interested in it, so I get a, a lot of feedback. And being able to do this um, without any extra resources or funding. Well, funding, not resources as such. What we ended up doing is at Macquarie University, where I work, their undergraduate programs, and now about to be across the board of all undergraduate programs, have to do what they call a PACE unit. So these guys have to do a practical project. And I was able to access students to develop the content of my decision tools and websites of my decision tools. Um, and while they are undergraduate science and undergraduate computing students, they don't have a clue about MND, so they've had to come on board very, very, very quickly. And they've developed an interest in MND and a, and a real passion for what these tools can do for people. And they're, they're quite excited about it, which is wonderful. So we've now got content for two tools, and we now have two groups of students who have developed websites in competition with each other. So I have to actually choose which website we're going to use. And I'll, I'll might end up passing this around to the stakeholder group to decide which one they think is the best. They're not perfect, they need a little bit of work, but um, I think you know, the next year we'll have those up and running and we'll actually have it and we'll be able to launch it and bang, it will be up there. So I'm really pleased with that. So, and the other, the other way to just keep going through to the end of that road is what matters most to people with MND and their families. And I have a lovely quote from one of the people living with MND in my stakeholder group. And basically she said that the tool gave her a context to think about you know, why she declined gastrostomy. And it's something that she'd have, uh, she decided a very long time ago to do, but she uh, felt very comfortable with the decision because it articulated the reasons behind her decision. So what I was thinking matched with what she was thinking, and I was so happy. <laughs> 
Just that basic thing. That was a wonderful thing to hear from her. All right, and so if I look back at that research thing, um, process map, basically the concept development, including your stakeholders and your translation plan built in from the very, very early stages before you're putting in your, ethics, uh, your funding applications and ethics applications, before you implement and evaluate, and then we're transforming it into practice and policy as best we can where we can. And that's it from me. Thank you.